Good morning, class. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and record uh, another lecture for us here. Um, I think this is where we wound up with this figure 40. We had discussed that before with the underslung uh, uh, secondary return going into the crossover brood. So we'll move on to this uh, uh, point 11 single pump control applications. Uh, start stop operation of the secondary pump has been used uh, for control in a variety of applications. Some of these are described below. So we're just going to look at uh, different uh, scenarios using uh, start stop uh, secondary pump operation. Okay, and so uh, I'll make that even a little bit bigger here. Okay, um, here is figure 41 control of baseboard secondary uh, control or secondary system, I guess. The wording is not very good. Um, so, this, this could be like an atrium or an area uh, with multiple, it could be baseboard uh, feeders. That's what they're calling out in the figure title here that these are typically uh, gravity circulation. You just put hot water through a coil, the coil has fins on it and the air rises. And you put these under uh, windows, that sort of thing in an atrium and the heat just rises across and picks up the glass load right there. Uh, you can see we have the uh, uh, anti-gravity uh, check valves in this system as this is gonna start this pump is going to start and stop based on uh, a space thermostat. And of course, you know, here's our primary supply, crossover supply. When this runs, we're going to pull some, if not all of this water uh, up into the secondary. It may be that we're going to temper it and we have some flow backwards uh, or to the left in the common pipe here. Uh, where we would mix at the T. But anyway, the thermostat controls this uh, secondary pump. <clears throat> when it runs, we get hot water out of the crossover bridge and uh, we can do heating into this space. Uh, let's see, 42, tap into an existing main for baseboard or convector. So th this sort of thing happens. Uh, sometimes it's intentional, but Sometimes in a plant or someplace, you've got just a hot water line running by and you need an additional heating unit. It could be that you've closed in an office, uh, maybe out in a plant that's not heated and there's going to be a person in there and you want to provide some uh, space conditioning for them. And so you can just tap in. This could be a return main. This could be, you know, 140, 150, 130 degree water would be enough to if you size the coil correctly to get enough heat to condition a small space, <clears throat> or it could be a supply. So you simply tap in, you pull out of that, uh, that uh, line where, you know, whatever it happens to be, uh, and you pump it through a coil and you put it right back in the same line. So you're gonna cool it down. So, you, you know, this flow coming back in the line may be 10, 15, 20 degrees cooler. Uh, but if this is a significant flow up here in the uh, main, then pulling a small uh, amount out, uh, cooling it down a little bit, putting it back in, probably isn't going to cause a big problem. Anyway, so this pump uh, just starts and stops, uh, pulls water when necessary. Otherwise, you shouldn't have any flow through here. Again, these uh, connections are close together with a little pressure drop across them. So when the pump's off, there's no driving force to uh, move water through the secondary circuit. Uh, let's see, 43, we have domestic uh, hot water generation. Remote from equipment supply room, uh, water, that's, that would be the primary water less than 250 degrees. And so uh, we have a tank that we're going to uh, maintain a temperature in. If this is domestic water, this might be 140, 150 degrees, something like that. And then you're going to pull out of this tank and go out for showers or, I mean, it could be a locker room, something like that. We have a heat exchanger in the tank. We've got some pretty hot water over here. This might be 200, 210, 220, whatever. So we can pull it up. Uh, and it flows up into the crossover bridge uh, when this tank uh, needs to, uh, some more heat, 
to build temperature in it, then it kicks on the secondary pump, which pulls this hot water up, puts it through the coil, runs back into the crossover bridge, back into the return main. Uh, you know, we got balancing valves so that we can adjust these flows. Uh, temperature sensor, so the pump runs as much as it needs to to keep the tank up to temperature. If you're not pulling any water out, pretty soon it's gonna reach its set point. This will click off and we'll just sit there. You know, if we just, if we're not using any hot water, <clears throat> we might have some uh, heat losses from the tank. So the pump might need to run just every once in a while to keep it up to temperature. But other than that, probably wouldn't run very much. If we're using a lot of hot water, we're pulling hot water out of this, making it up with cold water in which case this pump will need to run a uh, considerable amount to keep the tank up to its uh, <clears throat> desired set point. Uh, and notice our pump location is traditional. We're uh, pumping away from the crossover bridge into the secondary circuit. Now, this picture <clears throat> is just slightly different. This is a domestic water or steam generation remote from equipment room supply water over 250. So this is a medium temperature water that we're circulating uh, through the mains. And notice it's, it's, it's all the same picture except we have relocated the pump to the other side. So we're actually pumping into uh, the return, into the, the crossover bridge, which is not generally recommended. However, uh, because this water is so hot we want to cool it down with a heat exchanger if possible. Uh, well, it will, because if the, if the pump doesn't, anytime the pump runs, the water will get cooled down before it gets to it. And so that helps protect the pump a little bit. It could be a, 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 a cavitation risk, so you would have to be careful with that. And we can read what, uh, what their note says here. Figure 44 describes generation of domestic water or steam. So we could be generating steam because this uh, medium temperature is 250 to 320 and 320, you know, 250 to 320 is plenty hot enough to boil steam at a low pressure. Uh, let's see, in this case, the secondary pump is placed in the secondary return in order to reduce temperature effect on the pump. This differs from conventional application pump in secondary supply, but is almost always permissible for this application because of the generally low head booster pump requirement. So this is a, a pretty low pressure pump that we're looking at, typically in this kind of an application. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, on to figure 45. This is what we call face and bypass damper control. Uh, to eliminate heat wipe and permit deep temperature drop design if primary secondary pump off by end switch. Okay, so this would is typically on an air handler. So you've got uh, return air plus outside air coming through here. And the way we control temperature is um, we either, we can put air across the heating coil to heat it up, or we can bypass air around the coil. Now, or, and these are proportioning type dampers. But what, what, what they're doing here is they've got an end switch. So when this damper, which when it's open, it's allowing flow through the heated section across the, the hot water coil. So we want some heat. When this thing closes, it's gonna make this end switch, which is gonna turn off the pump. And that's because these dampers always leak. So if you didn't have the end switch, this pump would continue to run and this little bit of air leakage through here would get very, very hot and would come down and mix with the air that bypasses and would increase the temperature at a time when you don't want any heat because the, the thermostat has controlled the face and bypass dampers. And so if you're getting heat when the thermostat has closed this damper, then that's not a good thing for control of space temperature. So we want the end switch to cut off the secondary pump so that we don't get this, and that's called heat wipe, because it's, it's leaking through here, wiping heat off of the coil, which then mixes with this bypass air and affects 
uh, in a negative fashion our controllability and comfort conditions in the space. So that's kind of interesting. All right, let's move on. Uh, figure 46, industrial process control remote from equipment room. So we've got a shell and tube heat exchanger. And so we're gonna put, uh, and we've got a, a temperature sensor on the leaving fluid temperature. So our heating water, you know, from our primary comes up through the crossover, gets pumped through here, goes through the tubes, inside the tubes in the shell and tube heat exchanger, comes back out into the return. The fluid that we want to heat, this could be water, this could be all kinds of stuff, you know, in a uh, industrial process application. It comes in cold, goes on the shell side of this shell and tube, comes out on this side, heated up, and we monitor the temperature of it here, and we click the pump on and off in order to maintain this differential. And his comment here is the temperature sensor control elements illustrated should be immersion bulb type with close differential, which means it's going to maintain uh, between on and off between just a degree or a degree and a half. So you're not going to get much variation in temperature out of here. The variation in temperature in this line would basically be the differential on the start stop on the pump. All right, what do we have now? Uh, number 12, constant secondary pump operation, terminal unit control only. Okay, secondary zone pumping is often used in large systems employing high head distribution pumps in order to eliminate shut off head control valve problems. So this is where we may have a big delta P across here but because this is basically a point of no pressure change, then the only pressure that the secondary, these control valves in the secondary C is what's generated by this small secondary pump. So even though this is a big head drop over here, it, these control valves don't see it. It just sees uh, the head that's produced by this small circulating pump in the secondary. Um, and they have a note here, supply, temp reset at equipment room. So in the equipment room, we've got some additional controls that reset this water temperature, say with outside air. Mm -hmm. When it's really, really cold, you get really get pretty hot water through here. And then as the temperature goes up to, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40, we may still need a little bit of heat, but not so much. And so uh, to help the controllability of the system, we just reduce the temperature of this uh, primary water to the crossover bridge. Uh, these two-way valves can either, I mean, there are two-way valves. They can be two position valves, either open, shut, snap back and forth, or they could modulate over a range. Uh, my only other comment about this is, notice if all of these zones are satisfied, all these valves shut, we're gonna deadhead the secondary pump which may or may not be a problem. If it's a low head pump, uh, you might could get away with that. Otherwise, you could put a bypass down here. You could put one extra pipe in and you could measure the pressure differential. And when it gets up to a certain level, you could, you could pop open that bypass just to give the pump a path to circulate fluid around. Okay, uh, his comment, he's intending this to run all the time since the secondary zone pump is in continuous operation flow control valves or check valves, he said, aren't necessary because he's gonna pump, run the pump the whole time. But he also runs the risk of deadheading the pump. So something else to think about. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, item 13. Injection pump control methods, secondary zones. The injection pump has been widely used for reset control, both in boiler equipment room and at secondary zones. Typical applications are shown. So what we're showing here is we, we have uh, the controller on the injection pump has two temperature sensing elements or bulbs. One is on the supply water and the other is on the outside air. And so there's some logic built into the control on this pump that says, okay, 20 degrees outside, I want 
175 degree water. This is my set point. So I have to run this pump, pulse it, run it up until I get 175, and then I stop the pump. I pulse the pump in order to keep my uh, supply water temperature. And that's just at the point of mix um, at whatever I desire. And so we're going to keep running this, putting heat into this circuit until I get my water temperature up, say, to 175 in this case. It warms up outside. It goes up to 35 degrees. My set point goes down to 150. And so I simply, that changes the logic, controls the amount that the injection pump runs in order to give me my 150 right here out to my uh, radiators or coils or whatever these uh, represent. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Uh, let's see. On 49, injection pump application to space control or air handler. Uh, this is pretty similar. Um, we can um, just simply uh, run the injection pump in under the control of the space thermostat. Because this is, you know, we have the flow relationships are established. Um, when this pump runs, whatever its flow rate is, gets pulled up through the supply riser, and it's gonna mix here. Typically in a heating situation, the flow up through the riser is just a portion of what this uh, secondary pump is gonna push. The rest of it will come through the common pipe and mix right here and then go on out to the air handler. And so the more we run this pump, the hotter we make the water that circulates in the secondary, the more heating that we do. So by controlling this pump operation with the space thermostat, we can control the temperature in the space. Um, his note, uh, the heat injection pump operates uh, on off and injects shots of hot water into the continuously pumped secondary circuit uh, on controlled demand. Uh, space temperature is controlled by a conventional electric thermostat operating the pump on off through a relay. Reset temperature is obtained by an electric reset double bulb controller. Controls inexpensive, easily understood, and can be serviced by local personnel. So this is all pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and has been used uh, many, many times. Okay, let's look at injection riser and injection pump sizing. The injection riser is sized to the full load primary crossover flow requirement and in most cases is equal in size to the crossover pipe. Uh, the injection pump is always sized to the full load primary crossover flow requirement. This is illustrated in figure 50 below for our primary flow equal to secondary flow and in figure 51 for primary crossover flow less than secondary. So the way I typically think about this, when these flows are equal, I think about it being a chill water situation where we typically want as cold a water in the secondary as we can get, which means that we don't want any mixing uh, based on flow through a common pipe. <clears throat> and so if all of this is at 40 GPM, you can go back to your sizing chart and I think you would uh, probably determine that uh, two inch pipe is good at 40 GPM. So that says for 40 GPM up through the crossover, that's all two inch pipe. This is size for 40, this is size for 40, and the entire secondary is size for 40. So everything is going to be uh, two inch pipe. So when um, this is going to uh, flow continuously on the secondary, and when I run the injection pump, I will pull that 40 GPM of return, all of it, 
and I'll stuff it into the crossover bridge. It'll go into the return and I'll pull 40 GPM of my primary water directly up into my secondary. So whatever temperature I have in my primary, I have that same temperature in the secondary. And the return temperature here is the same as the return temperature down here. Okay, pretty simple. Now, in this case, this would probably be the heating situation where, uh, let's see, the crossover is sized for 10 GPM. So this is probably heating. This is probably really, really hot. And it's all sized for one and a quarter. And the 10 GPM, and this is 10 GPM on the injection pump. And this is 10 GPM on the injection riser. So all of this is sized for one and a quarter, which is the, the piping that's to handle the 10 GPM. And then up here in the secondary, everything is sized for the 40 GPM, which I'm gonna circulate. So it's all two inch around here. Um, okay. Uh, I think that's it on that. Okay, let's go on to this point 15. Need for injection line flow control valve. Slight pressure drop <clears throat> caused by continuous flow through the common pipe located in both the crossover and secondary circuits will cause flow from uh, the primary into the secondary with consequent lack of low load controllability. Flow control valves uh, will prevent injection line flow except under demand. Okay, so that is in relation, that are these flow control valves here. And notice we also put a balance valve up here so that you're gonna need that you know, or because this pump, when it runs, basically what it's doing is it's just pulling out of this line into this line and causing the flow up through here. So in order to balance this, we need to have some pressure drop here, an adjustable pressure drop. Okay, point 16, injection pump selection and operational considerations. The injection pump will almost always be a small, inexpensive booster pump that can be selected and operated without fear of overload. The pump should be uh, selected, however, so that at least four foot to five feet restrictive head is placed against it by the injection riser. That's this pressure drop right here that we're talking about. the flow controls and the injection line riser balance valve. Well, okay, so that's really the drop across this entire line. And I guess what little bits you have through here. Uh, time operation of the injection pump will be dictated by the differential precision of its controlling device and the rate of inje injected flow. The injection pump should operate for at least 30 seconds per time cycle to allow its motor to change from start to operating the windings. You don't want them chattering uh, back and forth on and off too quickly. Uh, the on off control differential should be set as to as narrow a band as possible and the minimum time cycle set by adjustment of the balance valve. Okay, so that's the discussion associated with figure 51. Uh, 17, injection pump applications. The injection pump is finding increased use in both industrial and commercial applications. Some generalized applications are shown below. Okay, so reset control secondary zone. Okay, so again, we can have a continuously pumped secondary, which is good for freeze protection. We can have a bulb in the outside air. We can have a bulb down here. 
measuring what temperature is going into the pump. And we can simply have a controller here that figures out how much of the time the injection pump needs to operate in order to have the desired temperature uh, pumped out into these uh, coils or uh, radiation uh, units uh, in the secondary. So pretty neat. We've kind of been through that before a little bit. Okay, reheat or space temperature control at the air handling unit. So this would represent an air handling unit and this might be your cooling coil and here's your fan blowing your mixed air, outside air plus return air through here. And this would be say our heating. It could be reheat. Uh, reheat is sometimes done for humidity control you would cool the air down here, condense water vapor out of it. It may be too cold, you would overcool the space, so then you have to heat it back up again, so that would be the reheat uh, situation, or it could be just regular space heating, in which case this is not in operation, we're not doing any cooling, we're simply heating under the control of the thermostat uh, to keep the space comfortable. And so again, we're pumping this uh, these coils all of the time with the secondary pump and we simply inject these shots of heat whenever we need to increase the temperature of the water supply to these coils. So pretty simple. Uh, circulated domestic water storage tank. Okay, so a couple things to talk about here. The recirculating pump so this, if you have say a motel or if you have a, a big house or whatever, where you want to have hot water available to all of the fixtures almost instantly, what you have to do is you put this little recirculating pump on and you put a loop out here and you simply are continuously circulating a little bit of water through this loop. And so that keeps that pipe hot. And then you come off of that line to go to each fixture. So you have, that's a very, very short line from the tap into this uh, supply line to the fixture. And so as soon as you turn the hot water on, you get hot water out of the tap, which, you know, this is, I've been in motels where you had to run the water for 10 minutes in the room before it got hot because they didn't, they're, they're, either didn't have a recirculating pump or it wasn't uh, piped up right. Okay, so anyway, uh, so this is just our hot water uh, storage tank. Uh, this is a wild flow heat source. By wild flow, we mean there's no control on it. Wild, <laughs> I don't know, HVAC is pretty dull boring stuff. When, when the best you can do with a wild, uh, flow heat source is just to say it doesn't have a control valve. That's probably not very exciting, but nonetheless, that's what it means. So we just flow, you know, a fairly significant flow through this heat exchanger all the time. It may go in hot, come out hot, or it may go in hot, come out cold, depending on whether this pump, this heat injection pump is operating. And then on this side, we're gonna continuously circulate uh, water from the, uh, domestic hot water storage tank. And then we will simply put hot water, we'll inject hot water into that circulating line when the thermostat says that we need to. So we're gonna, we'll have a set point on this. If this, if this is still hot and up to temperature, then this would satisfy uh, the controls and the injection pump wouldn't run. If this is cooler, we've been using it, then that would run the pump, then this water would get pulled in through the heat exchanger, heated up, put into this line, put into the tank. And this is just uh, cold, this is makeup water to the system. Okay, figure 55, instantaneous domestic water controlled from shell side. So this would be for instantaneous hot water heating. And so 
Uh, let's see what we so we've got continuous operation over here. So we're pulling. Uh, we're we're, we're going to maintain uh, 140 coming out of this heat exchanger, and then uh, this goes back out to the boiler. And so, uh, if this is getting too cool, then this pump will operate and inject heat into this line, which is going to continuously circulate. And then this is my domestic water. It's circulating all of the time. <clears throat> and whenever it gets cool, bingo. Um, it, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pump through this continuously, but there'll be uh, heat to be transferred into it based on the leaving water temperature out of the shell side of the heat exchanger. Wow, that's a little bit obscure. All right, and we'll do one more figure. Uh, I think I'm going to cap it off here. Uh, industrial fluid temperature control pump capacities equal max fluid uh, draw rate. <clears throat> okay, so we've got fluid going out to a system we need to be heated. Uh, we have a storage tank, so we're going to pump this continuously. And so coming out of the storage tank, we're going to monitor the temperature. And if it gets too cold, uh, then I'm going to run my injection pump down here, which is going to take that fluid and run it through a heat exchanger that has uh, always uh, access to thermal energy uh, heat from my heat source that has no control on it. It just runs through here. So whenever this gets cool, um, this pump runs. And really, I think, yeah, I think these arrows are in the wrong direction, by the way. This arrow, this should pull down here, go through up on this side. Well, no, maybe not. I guess because they're showing this circulating this way. Okay. So, and I guess this is for, because um, we're pumping the opposite direction, but that's probably for pump temperature control. So. Anyway, I think you get the you get the picture. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop this right now and get this posted. So, um, and I have another video on control valves. I think it's a, I think it's a Honeywell video that's pretty good. It's about 30 minutes, so I will send that along to you as well. So have a great rest of your day.